Uh, thank you, Doc. Well, being the last uh, speaker, I, I guess that everything has been said already, and uh, I, ha I run out of ideas. But I, well, I would like to thank SIARC and everyone involved with SIARC and Ben and Barbara. Uh, it's been a wonderful two days. I have met many people. I didn't have uh, time to talk to everyone. I, all the presentations were really interesting. But I think that the partnership between, you know, um, um, civil society organization and the private sector is really of paramount importance. I'm coming from the academia, but I have uh, a fairly um, experience uh, working in, in intergovernmental organizations, uh, academia, and the private sector. So I think that the combination of the three in SIARC, that's what has come to me as, as the most impressive thing I'm taking from the meeting. And well, here I'm talking on behalf of, uh, of uh, Carlton University, where I'm uh, working and who pays my bills. Uh, but I'm also the president of SIPA, which is the Heritage Documentation Committee of ICOMOS. And I think that we can establish a partnership pro with SIARC and, and ICOMOS and our committee in general. And I think it will be mutual, of mutual benefit because we have common goals and, and we can reach them. But I was very inspired by the talk yesterday and everything that was said about Afghanistan. So I had the pleasure, uh, the opportunity to work in Bamiyan in, back in 2003. And uh, when I look at, back at my work, uh, we were one of the first teams mapping the site after the destruction. Well, it was not only the destruction of the Buddhas, there were many things that were destructed and looted. And this is one example of something that ha had been looted one of the Buddha's um, uh, frescoes all over the, the Bamiyan uh, caves. And if I look back at 11 years, and then also looking back at the uh, local inhabitants, I, I just wonder myself if, if we did the correct thing of what we were doing there in 2003, mapping the site and, and doing the stabilization with UNESCO funds and so on. Have we done the right thing? Have we done the right thing for humanity? But have we done the right thing for the people living in Bamiyan? And that's something that probably we should take on in all the projects that we conduct, who is actually the, the final beneficiary of the data that we are collecting uh, in whatever means we are doing it, with laser scans or total stations. Well, I, I just want to talk about a little bit about my experience in heritage documentation and this duality between the why and the how. So we always talk about an application when we're doing heritage documentation. And I just want to bring a series of slides giving a professor I, I guess that I have to preach a little bit. Uh, but um, this is coming actually from Robin Letelier, uh, the late Robin Letelier, a Canadian colleague who wrote the guiding principles for uh, uh, recording uh, documentation and information systems for conservation of sites. It's a free available PDF online on the Getty Conservation Institute's website, and I recommend you to look at it. It's a document that is very well compiled. And he always balanced these ideas of the why, what, how, when, where, when we need to apply uh, uh, recording techniques specifically for heritage conservation. But everything has been said throughout the meeting, so we create a permanent record. If we have a permanent record, then we can manage the sites, we can promote, uh, given that we share information about them, and we can conduct conservation work or preventive maintenance and monitoring. And all these activities are only done when we have reliable information. If we look back on the 1964 chart of Venice, we have an article 16, it talks about publication. It says the, we need precise documentation, analytical and critical reports, uh, every stage of work should be there, archives, and it should be available to, to uh, research workers and should be published. I ask, I, I spent half of my time working with people in different uh, capacities, and I go to many conferences, and I always ask, and actually I was struck by the Sakara example, because I met the guy who did the Sakara uh, things, and I came, went to him and I said, can I have your presentation, because I want to show it to my students, and he didn't give it to me, and erased the presentation from the computer in the, in the conference. And that's to say, are we really, we are generating a lot of data, but are we sharing that data with others? And, and that should be like the guiding principle for anybody working in this field. And I think that SIARC is doing the right thing about having a, a repository where people can get access to that. But anyway, precise documentation uh, should be available for posterity. That's what I mean. That's what we're doing. That's our main idea. Then I also want to deal a little bit about inventories because we have been talking about the substantially documenting sites, but there is a lack of inventories all over the world. And without an in inventory, we cannot recognize, identify, and therefore protect any site in the world. And 
Um, not only that, also we have been talking a, little, a lot about uh, threats to heritage, but I, I would say that there is threats, uh, an earthquake, something that happens suddenly destroys everything. But one of the major issues uh, nowadays, I would say, is, is the development pressures. Development pressures all over the world, uh, building, upgrading the, the, the building environment, and heritage is basically threatened by that, uh, besides of other things. But I think that's the major threat that we have nowadays. And of course, these threats um, can be either um, caused by natural causes, as we said, but basically by human-made. And can we prevent those? I don't know to what extent. This is actually one slide that comes out of a publication we prepared for UNESCO's uh, office in a manner has been widely distributed and is also available on PDF for free, where there was a, a mitigation, a risk mitigation strategy for archaeological sites. And, and I think that this is a way that can complement that issue of not only taking information to this, to, for decision making, but also how that information allows us to identify risks uh, to sites. Uh, also, so, uh, Richard mentioned about significance of sites, so HAPS being you know, a place where we collect information so we can understand the values of sites. And the conservation field is all about conserving what is valuable, what is valuable not, not only to us uh, when we look at world heritage, but also to, to whoever is involved with heritage. This is an example of the Nara grid coming from the Nara Authenticity document, and here we see two things, attributes and dimensions. So we have attributes related to the built heritage, and we look at those dimensions through, through specific uh, topics. For instance, if we look at the Bami and Buddhas, we cannot say, no longer we can say that there is a high artistic value because it has been destroyed. But somehow there is a huge social value because of the fact of being destroyed. So are we protecting that site that was destroyed? And how are we doing? So values assessment should be the core or the front of any documentation strategy that we conduct anywhere and as, a, as the driven criteria of the things that we then want to identify with documentation. Nowadays, uh, we are in North America. I have been here for three years in Canada. Um, and we have a lot of contemporary art, uh, heritage. Uh, I think about 70 to 80 percent of the buildings in North America are older than um, are 50 years or older. Uh, and this is coming from the Getty Conservation Institute, in which they have identified a lot of conservation challenges con for contemporary architecture. And this is one of the emerging areas that heritage conservation is coming to. For instance, the lack of shared methodolo methodological approach, lack of recognition and protection. Are we doing also a lot of things? I was impressed looking at the Opera of Sydney. I think that we should see more examples of contemporary modern architecture from the movement, also in the stock of, of sites that we are documenting. I have also have had the pleasure in the last month to work with UNESCO in, in Bagan archaeological site in Myanmar. And this is an example of, of the need of inventories. This is the work of uh, Pierre Prichard from the Ecole Extreme, uh, the French School of Oriental uh, Research. And here, uh, Pierre prepared this uh, nine volumes inventory uh, where he documented with just floor plans and photographs. Uh, and some criteria, about 3,000 monuments in this site. Now, this site wants to be put in the World Heritage List. You can see in this example, this is a photo from Pierre in 1986, and this is a photo in 2006. Uh, you also have the record of that particular monument, and you can see the shift, the change. So just a basic volume art uh, books uh, printed in paper have become the, core, the front of the conservation of Bagan as a site. We are now working in the process of updating that inventory, and certainly we are also going to use uh, advanced technologies. But just to say how important inventories are. And in this line, I would like to reflect with this Peter Stone, who is from the Blue Shield in, in the UK, that he says that accurate, complete, as, uh, accessible, and secure inventories of all type of cultural heritage are very important for the management of, of the resources. Unfortunately, those inventories only exist in aspirations. And in many single, many, many projects I have been involved, this is what I have also found to be the case. We have uh, about um, 1,700 uh, 1, uh, sites listed on the World Heritage List, coming from 191 countries. But that, those countries are nominated using a tentative list. The tentative list, there is about 1,600 sites on the tentative list. And according to UNESCO guidelines, the tentative list should be the result of a truly inventory in each country. Is this the case? I don't think so. 
So that's one of the particular problems. So we are nominating sites into the World Heritage List, coming from the tentative list, but the tentative list is not based on factual criteria for designing and identifying those sites, especially in emerging and low-income uh, countries. Just by looking at Canada, we have, even a developed country, we have 25,000 properties designated as heritage, and we have a growing listing of 420 sites. So in a, just a, a small estimate, we have about 128 sites property, properties that currently require intervention. So we can see that gradually also inventories. So we need inventories, but inventories are gradually augmenting the need of documentation and adequate identification of sites and so on, and approaches. So not only documenting everything in full in 3D, but also documenting everything. As you know, digital information has a ma many cha challenges. One of them is that, uh, and I think that SIRE has done a great job in, in tagging all this alone. Uh, record provenance is one of the issues that I always uh, confronted with, when information lack the day when that documentation was conducted and how it was conducted and how accurate it was conducted. Then we have the, the issue of longevity of digital records. Can we read them in several years? But most important, we have a lot of digital information out there fragmented, no, disconnected, and in no use. Um, given that we don't have the record provenance, we don't have enough information to know if they are, those records are reliable or not. And this is what I confront every single day working in heritage documentation. This is an example of one project we did in Peru where we captured the geometry, the texture, the shape and the colors of a wall painting in an old church uh, near uh, Cusco. And this was just for condition assessment. So here we use uh, photogrammetry. We were not able to use laser scanning for, to bring it there. But you can see this, this is, uh, I think that, that when selecting a specific tool of heritage documentation, we need to have tools that can provide us with variable skills and accessibility that provide good use to, to make us build records, and that they are quick and reliable. But um, I, I was uh, very happy to hear from Richard, for instance, the, the, the drawing on, 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 the, on, on your right, you can see this is a condition assessment of that particular wall painting. So not only the photographic record is needed, also the condition assessment, the weathering that is affecting the site is also important to be equally important to be documented as the texture or the color of sites. When selecting tools for heritage recording, we have different aspects. This comes from my PhD like really, really long time ago. But I always reflect to that because uh, there are three uh, things which are crucial when adopting or selecting tools. One of them is the project needs, for sure. The accessibility to the heritage place, but also equally important is the organizational impact that that heritage documentation strategy is going to do. Um, I have come to many places. When we were working in Afghanistan, we gave a total station to the uh, Ministry of Culture, and the Ministry of Culture's headquarters didn't have electricity. So this is an aspect of this disconnect between technology. Uh, so now I just uh, very quickly, I show two examples. This is a project in, uh, in, with the Getty Conservation Institute and CERCAS, which is the Center for Conservation and Restoration of, the, of Heritage in the Sub Atlas in, in, in Morocco. And here we have a heritage place, which is urban architecture, irregular, complex, and organic. Uh, we need records to make maintenance and conservation. And we need something, uh, some technology that, has a, that can provide accessibility to a low-income organization that has some, uh, a lot of lack of capacity in digital means, and they have few staff. So in this case, we selected photogrammetry, and you can see that for mod brick, uh, structure for motion photogrammetry, which uh, one of the speakers was uh, uh, talking about this morning, is very fast, very useful. Uh, it could be very accurate, but it needs to be very accurate when the shapes are very regular and the photos can compare algorithms. Again, the algorithms can compare uh, common points on the photos. So for it, this type of application of urban architecture, I wouldn't go for other techniques. And also for Morocco, it's very easy to learn to use this technique. And you can see we can produce variable types of records, uh, measure drawings, uh, elevations, cross sections. We can prepare floor plans uh, of the site uh, for very complex parts, and we can produce uh, cross sections. All these are measured drawings. We can say that 3D is very important. I, I love working with 3D but the people in Morocco are using 2D for their assessments. So this is, was the end product for this particular project. Then, 
I jumped to another project in Canada. It's the uh, Alexander Graham Bell's Bainbrea uh, House, where we had the pleasure to work with the Alexander uh, Mabel Bell Legacy Foundation and other partners. And here we use laser scanning because um, the engineers working on the conservation can adopt the technology used by laser scanning and the output. And in this case, we went on a mission and we worked on two weeks uh, mapping the entire house. We have created a beam model in which we will use some in, do some energy simulation and a structural analysis of the site. And laser scanning is fully justifiable for this project in particular because the technology can be adopted by the local, the local partner working with that. And it was fast, reliable, but if you look a little bit at the house, if we were to use photogrammetry here, the algorithms would have worked a little bit less accurately because the house is, is, is let's say the texture of the house is not as irregular or as organic as urban architecture. So here, always the application has to drive the tool, not the tool has to drive the application. Um, here are some shots. All right. Um, a little bit about SIPA. So SIPA is an organization that was born from the International Council of Monuments and Sites and the uh, International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. We are a voluntary basis uh, organization. It was created after Abu Simbel. Um, Abu Simbel is one of the examples of international safeguarding of monuments. Um, SIPA has been about 45, around, 45 years around, and we try to bridge the needs of users in conservation with providers of technology. Uh, we are mostly people working in academia. We have people, some few people in the, in the private sector, so some NGOs. I would really like to invite more people in the private sector to get involved. We organize symposia. We have collaboration with many organizations, and we basically do dissemination of of those papers and activities. We also conduct about two summer schools every year for heritage recording, uh, basically in Europe. Um, another issue that is important, uh, this is coming up specifically for uh, our ongoing research, um, are historic buildings sustainable and how heritage documentation can provide information for that? How can we prove to other people that we need to preserve buildings? because they are sustainable. They have low impact on climate change. They have embodied energy, embodied carbon. They have durability. They have a long life and loose feet. They can be repaired easily. They use indigenous materials. How can, this is a question to everyone. I don't know if anybody has asked, but I think that the issue of sustainability is coming more and more important, specifically in, in North America, Europe, and other countries. All right, so for my closing remarks, um, some thoughts I, I, I thought be, will be relevant to the meeting. Who's the ultimate the beneficiary of the public of the information that we are producing? I already mentioned that. Uh, we need to produce good practices that actually help us characterize heritage sites from the value, uh, significance, and authenticity assessments. We need to develop guidelines for correct provenance information relevant to, to the heritage information people. They should be standard-based. Uh, standard is a big word. We can probably talk about that in the workshop. We need interoperability between different technologies. We need to address the issue of longevity in the, in the common future. People have mentioned that at all, a, a lot. And design a good dissemination strategy. So I was just talking with a few colleagues that it will be very interesting just to make a general inventory of all digital information that is available. And we can start just by looking at all the papers, at least in our organization in SIPA and in many other organizations where we have tons of laser scanners being used by many people that have produced many excellent records. So we can try to uh, prevent a little bit that duplication work that we've seen today. So today we have mentioned Sakara already three times. So that's one of the examples of that duplication work. What could be the potential SIPA contribution to SciArc's initiative? Well, we want to help in that, act, that issue of permit perpetual access to heritage data. I think that's, that's one of the core actions. Suggestions for updating and upgrading, because scanning a site today, that doesn't mean that it's saving the site, because the site is going to evolve. So we need to have a strategy of how that site is going to be monitored with the current technology that we have. We have sites change throughout time. Uh, collaborate on, on, on prepared specifications for recording uh, develop workflows which are good for everyone. 
uh, identify additional sources of documentation, like I was saying before. I was puzzled by the technology centers uh, for, uh, to, with local schools and universities. Probably we can help training people so we can minimize that organizational impact, especially in the emerging world and also contribute to organize more uh, capacity building. I am, given that I am in academia, I am a strong belief that, that there is where we need to preach, you know, specifically I teach architects and engineers, is basically where we need to preach this uh, because uh, they are the ones who are going to take over uh, sooner than later. And if people are aware of what is happening, it will be much better for all of us. So with this, I want to conclude and I also want to invite you to the upcoming activities of SIPA. We have a, our symposia will be held in Taiwan next year, and I would like to kindly invite everyone that wants to participate. As I said, SIPA is a voluntary organization, and we are just there to get more members and to collaborate with other people and get heritage documentation where it should be. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>